Hello viewers, I am Dr. Rovio. I work as a lecturer in pathology in a medical college hospital and I am making this video for my students and also for you. Hope someone finds this helpful. Today's topic is pathologic calcification. In this video, we will try to define pathologic calcification, then classify it, and then briefly discuss its two types which will include dystrophic calcification, metastatic calcification, followed by brief discussion on morphology, pathogenesis, and samoma bodies. Okay, so let's begin. First question, what is pathologic calcification? So, as written in your textbook, pathologic calcification can be defined as abnormal tissue deposition of calcium salts together with small amount of iron, magnesium and other mineral salts. And in some other textbook, you will also see another definition and it states Pathologic calcification can be defined as abnormal tissue deposition of calcium salt in tissues other than osteoid and enamel. Now let me explain that. Normally calcification do occur in osteoid of our bones and also in the enamel of teeth. So that is normal calcification. However, when calcium salts are getting deposited in tissues other than osteoid and enamel that is known as pathologic calcification so now that we have defined pathologic calcification now we will move on to the next point and discuss its types so pathologic calcification can be classified in two types they are dystrophic calcification and metastatic calcification. Now, you must know the difference between these two types. This is a very high yield topic and often asked in the exam. The examiner may ask you how can you differentiate between dystrophic and metastatic calcification. So the first point is in the type of tissue. Dystrophic calcification is seen in dead or dying tissue or in degenerated tissue whereas metastatic calcification is seen in normal living tissue so that's the first difference the second difference is regarding the serum level of calcium in case of dystrophic calcification serum calcium level remains normal and there is no abnormality in calcium metabolism Whereas in case of metastatic calcification, the serum calcium level is always raised and that has raised secondary to some abnormality in calcium metabolism. So always remember these two differences between dystrophic calcification and metastatic calcification. So now that we have defined and classified pathologic calcification, now we will briefly discuss each type. So we will begin with dystrophic calcification. And I have already mentioned that dystrophic calcification can occur either in dead tissue or in degenerated tissue. So let's uh, give examples of these things one by one. So we will start with dystrophic calcification occurring in dead tissue and in your textbook you will see a lot of examples are given. So the first example that we will talk about is in caseous necrosis. Particularly in caseous necrosis of tuberculosis there may be calcification seen and that calcification will be of dystrophic type and such dystrophic calcification can be seen in tuberculosis either in the lungs or in the lymph node. Now I also have a separate video on tuberculosis so you can also look into that for more information. So coming back to today's topic, 
The second example of dystrophic calcification occurring in dead tissue is in case of liquefactive or liquefaction necrosis. Recall that um, abscess um, can happen as a result of liquefactive necrosis and sometimes chronic abscess can have calcification inside them. So that is an example of dystrophic calcification occurring in liquefactive necrosis in case of chronic abscess. The third example that you will see in your textbook is in fat necrosis. We know that fat necrosis can occur either from trauma or from pancreatitis and in fat necrosis sometimes there is deposition of calcium salt and that will result in dystrophic calcification. Now the fourth example is a bit tricky. Here you can see I have written gamna gandhi bodies. Now don't run away. Uh, what is gamna gandhi bodies? These are seen in spleen when there is chronic venous congestion which is also known as CVC and they are composed of calcium and also along with hemosiderin and fibrosis so that is gamma gandhi bodies they contain calcium and along with calcium there is also hemosiderin and uh, fibrous tissue and so that is also another example of dystrophic calcification occurring in dead tissue. Moving on, dystrophic calcification in dead tissue can also happen in thrombus, particularly in venous thrombus. Calcium can get deposited, calcium salts can get deposited, and that will make the venous thrombus hard like a stone, and that is then called flavolith. Recall that lith stands for stone. It becomes stony hard. The venous thrombus becomes stony hard and then it is called flavolith. The next example is in hematoma. Now, you may be asking Dr. Rabiul, what is hematoma? Hematoma means accumulation of blood outside the blood vessels. And sometimes when hematoma has occurred in close vicinity of a bone, the hematoma can get calcified and that is another example of dystrophic calcification occurring in dead tissue. That can happen in hematoma when the hematoma is in close vicinity of bones. The next example of calcification is when there are some dead parasites. Examples are hydatid cyst, cystosoma egg, and cysticercosis. In all these cases, calcium can deposit on these dead parasites and result in dystrophic calcification. Dystrophic calcification can also occur in breast carcinoma that we can also see by mammography. And it can also occur in infarction as well. So these were the examples of dystrophic calcification occurring in dead tissue. Now we will move on and discuss the examples of dystrophic calcification occurring in degenerated tissue. Now there are a lot of scenarios where dystrophic calcification occurs in degenerated tissue. Say for example in dense old scar that has undergone hyalinization. There dystrophic calcification can follow. Another example is in the atheroma what is atheroma? Atheroma are collection of degenerated materials beneath the tunica intima of blood vessel and usually they contain, among other things, they contain macrophage, lipid particles, cell debris, fibrous tissue, etc. And sometimes such atheroma can undergo calcification and usually calcification is common in atheroma of the aorta and coronary arteries. The next example is Monkeberg's medial sclerosis. Dystrophic calcification can happen in the tunica media of muscular arteries usually in elderly person and that is known as Monkeberg's 
media sclerosis. Recall that any blood vessel has three layers. They are tunica intima, the innermost layer. Then there is tunica media, the muscular layer, and beyond that is tunica adventitia. And in case of Monkeberg's medial sclerosis, there is calcification, dystrophic calcification in the tunica media of the blood vessel. And it is common in muscular arteries of elderly persons. So always remember that thing. The next example is stroma of tumor. Dystrophic calcification can happen in degenerated stromal tissue, say for example in fibroid of the uterus or in case of thyroid adenoma. Even in case of goiter we can also sometimes see dystrophic calcification in the stroma. Moving on to the next example, now we will discuss in detail about samoma body after a while in the later part of today's video. But for the moment, remember that uh, in certain tumor, there is calcification in a laminar fashion uh, where there are spherules of calcification and those are known as samoma bodies. And we will talk more about this after a while. The next example where dystrophic calcification can happen in degenerated tissue is in cyst. When a cyst was present for a prolonged period of time, the walls of the cyst can undergo dystrophic calcification. And the last example um, that I will give is about the uh, senile degenerative change. In old age, some cartilages undergo such dystrophic calcification. Say for example, the coastal cartilage and also the cartilage of the trachea bronchi uh, undergo dystrophic calcification in old age following degenerative change and such dystrophic calcification can also happen in old age in the pineal gland of our brain and one thing I missed and that was the term calcinosis cutis what is that here we see dystrophic calcification in the skin and subcutaneous tissue those calcification happen in an irregular and nodular fashion however the exact cause or etiology is unknown in most of the cases. So these are the examples where we see degenerated uh, tissue uh, undergoing dystrophic calcification. So now that we have discussed about dystrophic calcification, now we will move on and discuss about metastatic calcification. Recall that in metastatic calcification, it happens in normal and living tissue and the serum calcium level is high. That means it can happen in one of two mechanisms. One mechanism is the calcium resorption from the bone may be abnormally high and the second mechanism is there may be increased absorption of calcium from the intestine. So let's talk about uh, these two things one by one. Now excessive mobilization of calcium from the bone can occur due to a variety of causes. The first cause is in hyperparathyroidism, that is when there is increased parathyroid hormone that can result in this. And hyperparathyroidism can develop when there are some tumor in the parathyroid gland, say for example in case of parathyroid adenoma. And also hyperparathyroidism can develop when there is ectopic parathyroid hormone like protein secretion from other malignant tissues. Okay, so always keep those two things in your mind. Primary causes of hyperparathyroidism will include tumor of the parathyroid gland. And hyperparathyroidism can also develop secondary to chronic renal failure and also in case of parathyroid hyperplasia. So in all these cases, there will be increased mobilization of calcium from the bone. The second cause of increased mobilization of calcium from the bone is when there is some bony lesion, say for example in case of multiple myeloma and leukemia, it can happen. And the third cause uh, is when the patient or person is in prolonged bed rest. And the idea is when a patient is immobilized for a long period of time, his limbs are not getting used. So there is a term known as disuse atrophy of the bones. The bones are getting smaller uh, due to lack of use. And this disuse atrophy is sometimes followed by metastatic calcification.
So that is also another cause when there is increased mobilization of calcium from the bones and also accelerated bone turnover that we see in Paget's disease can result in metastatic calcification as well. So those were in short about the first mechanism of metastatic calcification. The second mechanism of metastatic calcification involved excess absorption of calcium from the intestine. So let's see how that thing happens. So there are a lot of causes here as well. The first one is when there is excess vitamin D, which is a term known as hypervitaminosis D, that can result in increased calcium absorption. Milk alkali syndrome is another cause when we will see increased calcium absorption from the gut. And milk alkali syndrome uh, happens when a person takes excessive amount of calcium, either in the form of milk or whenever he's taking um, medication that contain calcium, say for example calcium carbonate due to treatment of peptic ulcer. So excess intake of milk or excess intake of calcium carbonate can result in milk alkali syndrome and there we will also see metastatic calcification. And the third cause where we can see metastatic calcification due to excess absorption of calcium from the gut is hypercalcemia of infancy uh, in that condition, we can also see metastatic calcification. So also remember hypercalcemia of infancy. So now that we have discussed the two mechanisms of metastatic calcification, now we will move on to the next topic and discuss the pathogenesis of pathological calcification. How pathological calcification occurs. So calcification can occur as hydroxyapatite crystal, the same type of crystal that we see in side bones, and it can also happen in non-crystalline amorphous form as well. So first let's talk about the pathogenesis of dystrophic calcification. And dystrophic calcification occurs in several steps. So in the first step, calcium ion binds on the surface of the vesicle membrane. So as you can see I have drawn a cell here. Inside the cell we have nucleus, different organelles and suppose this is the vesicle which, with which calcium will bind. And on the surface of these vesicles we have phospholipid. Recall from your histology classes all cell membranes contain phospholipid, right? and all vesicle membrane also contains phospholipid. So calcium initially will bind with the phospholipid present on the surface of those vesicle membrane. Then what will happen? The phospholipid will uh, use phosphatase enzyme that is associated with the vesicle membrane phospholipid and they will produce phosphate and calcium will then bind with phosphate and this calcium and phosphate binding will be repeated and that will result in concentration of those vesicles with calcium and phosphate deposition. Later what will happen there will be some structural changes in the calcium and phosphate and that will result in formation of microcrystal and later more and more calcium phosphate will get deposited and that will result in propagation of such microcrystal and result in calcification. So that is the pathogenesis of dystrophic calcification and always remember the calcification that we will see in metastatic calcification will also be similar morphologically. Now one thing you have to remember we have said that dystrophic calcification occurs in dead and dying tissue. As a matter of fact, they are a telltale sign of cell injury. And on the contrary, metastatic calcification occurs in normal and living tissue. Although it can happen in any living tissue, but metastatic calcification commonly involves the interstitial cells of gastric mucosa. It can also happen in the kidney and also in systemic arteries, pulmonary veins and lungs. So also keep that thing in your mind. So now that we have discussed the pathogenesis of pathologic calcification, now we'll move on and discuss the morphology of pathologic calcification. 
So with hematoxylin and eosin stain, the site of calcification will appear basophilic, amorphous and granular or sometimes clumped in appearance. It can be seen inside the cell, outside the cell or in both intra and extracellular location. Now one interesting finding that we will sometimes see, particularly in dystrophic calcification happening in certain tumors, is the presence of samoma body. Now what do we mean by samoma body? Now what happens here is a single necrotic cell acts as a seed crystal and calcium and minerals get deposited surrounding that cell that necrotic cell in a laminated fashion and that gives the appearance like grain of sand and recall that samoma came from the word samos that means grain of sand and that is in fact samoma body so as you can see this is a seed crystal at the center you can see the seed crystal that derived from a single necrotic cell and surrounding that we can see calcium and minerals are getting deposited in layers in sort of concentric fashion in layers in laminated form and this entire structure is known as samoma body now one important uh, topic for your exam is the causes of samoma body the examiner may ask you uh, tell us some disease condition in which we can see samoma bodies and I have an easy way to remember those diseases. I just use three letters from the word samoma. So I will use P, S and M to remember those diseases. So starting with P, what are the diseases in which we will have samoma body present? Sometimes they are papillary carcinoma of the thyroid, papillary serous cyst adenoma of the ovary, papillary serous cyst adenocarcinoma of the ovary and prolactinoma of the pituitary gland okay moving on to the letter s somatostatinoma is a condition where samoma body is also common and then moving to the letter m meningioma the tumor of the meninges meningioma and also pleural and peritoneal mesothelioma they can also result in formation of samoma bodies. So also remember those names for your exam. So this concludes today's video on pathologic calcification. Since pathologic calcification can indicate presence of underlying disease, so you must know about this topic as well. So that's all for today. If you like my videos, do comment share and subscribe and let me know and as for my students i will also recommend you to go through your textbooks to look at more images and flowcharts so that's all for today until next time take care and stay blessed and since i'm uploading this video during eid so also eid mubarak to all my viewers thank you